Well, let me uh, extend my welcome to all of you for joining us today, and our thanks, of course, to the Aspen Institute and Intel for co-hosting this discussion. Now that we have created uh, a non-biodegradable backdrop, we clearly will be having these collaborations into perpetuity, because it's quite lovely co-branding. Um, I want to thank uh, Rob for all the good work he's done and for that last panel. I think it really set up this discussion quite nicely. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Jason Grumet and founded the Bipartisan Policy Center about seven years ago with the help of Senators Dashiell, Dole, Baker, and Mitchell. And all I will tell you about uh, the BPC is that we like constructive partisanship. We think that it is the collision of ideas that have solved problems in the past, and it is that interaction which will solve problems in the future, hopefully with some better information. Um, as the leader of the Bipartisan Policy Center, I can tell you something that you know quite well, which is uh, it's, it's tough out there. In the environment we currently exist in, there is a profound lack of trust. And in that situation, it's basically a zero-sum conversation, whether the issue is tax reform, immigration policy, energy policy, controlling health care costs, or navigating the tension between security and privacy, much of the discussions we see now assume that if one idea benefits, another idea has to lose. The neat thing about innovation is it creates some option space. It essentially grows the pie and allows a different kind of imagination for policy discussion. This is one of the principal reasons why the BPC is enthusiastic about big data and innovation in general. Um, my personal view is that there is a almost certainty that the private sector is going to make better decisions based on access to this data. And there's a possibility that the public sector will do so as well. And I hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit. If I can just get existential for a moment, since the dawn of history, most private and public decisions have been made using folklore, anecdote, and emotion. When we've been lucky over the past century, public policy has occasionally been guided by statistically relevant fact trinkets, which have been extrapolated to inform our broader conversation. This has now changed. We are now awash in data. As recently as the year 2000, only 25% of the world's information was stored digitally. Today, it's 98%. I have no idea how people figured that out, but I find it a compelling statistic. Over the past several months, we've had the pleasure of hosting two of these forums, exploring the potential of big data on healthcare and on homeland security. I think these are two fields which you've heard about today and obviously hold great promise. Delighted to have the chance to continue that conversation now with two prominent leaders in the field, Governor Jim Douglas and Congressman Jim Turner. As I think many of you know, Governor Douglas hails from the great state of Vermont. He was elected governor in 2002. Among his many accomplishments, none has been more prominent than his creation of a blueprint for health, which has increased the quality and access uh, of folks in Vermont's health care, uh, with a focus on chronic disease prevention and management of resources. As a testament to Jim's legacy, Vermont has ranked the healthiest state by the United Health Foundation each of the last four years. Also proud that Jim uh, serves as a member of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Governor's Council. Governor Jim Turner gotta has vote. represented, um, <laughs> Governor, got a, got a demotion, depends on who you ask. Congressman Jim Turner uh, represented what used to be known as the second district in the great state of Texas. He was ranking member on both the Committee on Homeland Security and the Subcommittee on Terrorism under the Armed Services Committee. Jim was also chair of the Blue Dog Coalition, which was a powerful group of problem-solving Democrats that has not fared as well since Jim chose to leave the Congress. Uh, now Jim leads the legislative and public policy group at Arnold and Porter. And finally, Jim serves as a member of our Homeland Security Project. So we really have a great duo of BPC friends and family and uh, are now going to probe a bit on their views on these issues. Um, so most conversations about anything future-leaning imagines the 
barriers and opportunities. You know, there's a Chinese character that does that, and it, since then it's pretty much been the way most panels in America have been run. And I'm going to choose not to be innovative and at least begin with that structure. Um, so let's start with the optimism. How big a deal is this? I guess I want to ask each of you to just share your sense of where the real promise of big data lies. Why don't we start out in healthcare? Oh, for the days of existentialism. But uh, we're beyond that, Jason, and it's great to have a chance to talk about the role of data in healthcare delivery and uh, reform efforts that are underway around the country, but uh, perhaps more importantly in the individual states where I would argue, having been in state government for decades, uh, is really where the action is. As you graciously suggested, uh, about a decade ago, we launched the Vermont Blueprint for Health. Um, it seemed to me when I assumed office that we had to do something to control the uh, rapid increase in the cost of care. We had one of the most generous Medicaid programs in the country. Uh, we're the second oldest state by median age, so um, by definition, we have a lot of chronic illness. Um, uh, most uh, seniors have one or more chronic diseases that we uh, needed to, uh, to address. Uh, and um, we have long had a, a culture of health. Uh, we have the cleanest air in the Northeast. Uh, we have lots of outdoor recreational activities, getting to ski season, come on up and uh, see us. Um, so we wanted to do what we can to, to keep the people of Vermont as healthy as possible. And the strategy is to, uh, to focus on wellness, to, to deal with people where they spend their time. So we have workplace wellness programs. Uh, we have a healthy aging initiative for our seniors. Uh, we have uh, what I call the Fit and Healthy Kids program uh, to uh, work with kids in the schools on, on nutrition and, uh, and physical activity. Uh, and we uh, do it through a patient-centered medical home model uh, where we have a community health team, not only a primary care physician, but uh, other professionals who are there to respond to whatever needs the individual patient might have. And uh, it's worked quite well, as Jason uh, generously suggested. Now, what's the role of, of um, information technology and, and data in this effort? Well, there are several. Um, uh, the model for health information exchanges varies from state to state. In some uh, cases it's all public, in other cases it's all private. Ours is a partnership. We created a nonprofit entity called VITAL, Vermont Information Technology Leaders. I think we started with the acronym then filled it in. Well, that seems to be the way it goes. Um, but it's um, uh, been quite successful in encouraging the use of health IT uh, among practitioners and we facilitate it with a surcharge, uh, or a little tax on on uh, health insurance claims uh, that provides the resources that can be used for grants to, uh, uh, to, to make that more available. Uh, secondly, we have a, an all claims uh, database uh, where information about those claims, uh, clinical information is, uh, is assembled, uh, which is useful not only in uh, getting a sense of what's going on uh, in the clinical world, but uh, frankly, it's helpful to our regulators because we've long had uh, state governments setting uh, insurance premiums and uh, approving hospital budgets, uh, so getting a feel for what uh, services are delivered and how much they cost has been helpful in, the, in that effort as well. We uh, are able to integrate uh, other data into uh, our clinical database. Um, and uh, for example, from uh, social and economic services, from uh, the labor department, from the corrections department, uh, which helps us do some predictive modeling uh, to uh, uh, get a sense of what uh, health issues might uh, need to be uh, uh, considered in, in the case of an individual uh, through his or her caseworker, but also to see if the services are working. Um, uh, did uh, that um, and it's all de-identified, but, uh, but do uh, opiate-addicted um, uh, Vermonters um, get into the workforce? Do they stay out of jail? And by uh, integrating all kinds of non-clinical data, that's been uh, very helpful to us as well. Um, we talked a little uh, earlier this morning about uh, personal health management, the new programs uh, that are available through some uh, companies that Mr. Case mentioned. And, and um, um, now that people are on the web all the time, uh, uh, as uh, um, an almost Vermonter, Dr. Coop used to say, take charge of your health. Um, people are doing that and, uh, and we can capture some of the information that individuals are, are, uh, are coming up with. And um, uh, it's allowed us to implement a payment reform strategy too um, with, with Medicaid and our private insurers and more recently with Medicare. Uh, we're one of 10 states that are participating in a pilot program uh, to use uh, those resources for preventive care. 
Uh, I often say that we don't have a we don't have a healthcare system in America. We have a sick care system, and uh, we're now using. Uh, all those dollars for preventive efforts, and it's really making a tremendous difference. And we've seen some real results. We uh, saved over a quarter of a billion in our Medicaid costs during the first five years of a waiver uh, program, and for us, that's real money in the little state. Uh, and um, we've seen a decline in the uh, emergency department uh, visits, the hospital admissions among those in our blueprint communities. Uh, not the whole state is participating yet, but uh, more than two thirds. So it's making a difference where it counts. It's using uh, data and technology, uh, the information that's now available uh, to improve outcomes. And, and uh, the, the proof is in the uh, statistics to which Jason alluded that we've been the healthiest state in America for now five out of the last six years. Uh, they keep recalculating, kind of like the unemployment rate, I guess. But, um, but uh, we're very proud of the, uh, the health of our population and we'll continue to pursue the blueprint strategy uh, using the data that are available to us. Thank you, Jim. So, Congressman Turner, the questions about data and security have been moderately prominent uh, over the last couple of months. Um, we'll talk about some of the concerns, but give us your sense of really what the, what the opportunities are. Well, the first thing that always comes to my mind when we talk about uh, the collection of big data, the ability to analyze it in real time, is how critical that innovation has been to our national security. Uh, you know, we live uh, in the post 9-11 era, and you know, it's amazing to me that we have young people now that uh, you have to remind them what 9-11 was or tell them what it was. It's almost like, uh, you know, the last generation having to be reminded of what was Pearl Harbor and why did that happen. But I think the, the innovation in, in big data and the innovation in computer power uh, came just at the right time because we have a world today where a handful of individuals, even a single individual, through the use of a biological agent or chemical agent or radiological agent can literally uh, do damage to hundreds and even thousands of individuals. And even, you know, in the worst case scenario with the use of a biological agent could result in destruction of a, the, a large percentage of the world's population. So the, the ability to utilize data in real time to connect the dots and to try to prevent these kinds of attacks uh, is, is really critical to our national security. And it, has, it disturbs me as a uh, former member of the Homeland Security Committee after 9-11 to, to, to see uh, that today there's a lot of folks who question whether we should be collecting this kind of data. Uh, in my mind, it's not that we shouldn't be collecting it, it's we should be controlling who has access to it and how it's used. Because the technology that enables us to, co to collect this data is the first line of, of defense in the warfare that we're gonna face in the years ahead. Of course, it's also true that the advent of the internet and big data has provided our enemies with a, a tool that they did not previously have. The concept of cyber attacks, cyber warfare, uh, is very real today. And so along with the blessings of big data and the ability to analyze it and collect it in real time, uh, we've placed a new tool in the hands of those who would seek to destroy us. I think we noted in the last uh, few days with the Europeans being quite upset, and I think perhaps <laughs> rightly so, to find that we were collecting uh, f uh, some of the voice, mess voice uh, communications of, of Chancellor Merkel, uh, that um, there are a lot of folks who tend to say, well, we shouldn't be doing all this anymore. And frankly, you know, governments have collected data on friends and foes for years to make intelligent decisions about national security. And I suspect that we'll continue to do that. Uh, I do appreciate the fact that the Congress in light of all these revelations, has taken a, a leadership role in trying to provide stronger oversight. We do need strong oversight. We need the rules of the road to be defined and controlled uh, by congressional uh, decision making, which reflects the interest of the public at large. Uh, we don't need to let all this just occur in the back room. But as I said, much of it needs to be maintained uh, uh, secure 
and I think a lot of the criticism that we've seen recently uh, has been unjustified. Uh, the use of big data allows us to intercept terrorist financing. It allows us to identify those who may be plotting against us. Uh, those things are critical, and in the world in which we live, we cannot give that up, uh, and we must be the leader in it because those who would seek to destroy us are always trying to catch up. And we're, we're in a period now where our enemies uh, aren't operating at the sophisticated level that they will be operating a decade from now. And that's going to be a real challenge to us and a threat to our national security. Well, that's a, a great opening. Um, let's turn a little bit now to the challenges and barriers as you are both public servants. I um, want to think mostly about the kind of public policy aspects of this question. Um, I guess I'll start again uh, with you, Governor Douglas. Uh, talk a little bit about um, how your legislature understood big data. In other words, we, we don't have a lot of trust. And I guess my question is, does, does the verify side of that equation provide any latitude? Um, and I'll just add to that my own concern, um, and I think uh, Mike reflected this in the prior discussion, Congress isn't doing a very good job with little data. In my recent experience, um, things that members of Congress cannot independently assess and verify are hard to engage. You know, climate change on one hand, you know, GMOs on the other. So how do you see legislatures engaging with data? And did it help you at all to advance some of the projects you were proposing? Well, remember when we uh, undertook this effort starting a decade ago, it was before some of the mm -hmm. uh, recent revelations to which Congressman Turner referred, some of the um, breaches we've seen in health care security. Um, it seems like at least weekly there's some health organization that reports another hiccup in uh, um, access to data inappropriately. We had a, a breach in our own um, state health exchange, and it's just starting up, of course, but uh, there was a breach, and the state official in charge of it um, denied that there was one in legislative testimony, was reprimanded by the governor. and So uh, we've got to uh, develop the kind of trust uh, to which you referred, Jason, if, if the American people are going to buy into uh, using more data, collecting more data. Uh, we have to uh, assure them that the, uh, that the use uh, is more important than the, the risk. And um, that, I think, is an ongoing process. Um, we, uh, we need to do a couple of other things, uh, in my view. We need, we need to standardize the data. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I co-chaired uh, an entity called the State Alliance for eHealth uh, under the auspices of the National Governors Association. Um, and uh, some of those of you who really want to get into this, some of the reports are online on the NGA website. Um, but we, we realized that um, a lot of health providers and entities aren't talking to each other. Um, Within the federal government, the uh, security and privacy standards are different for different agencies and different programs. I mean, uh, we're talking about uh, states talking to each other, but one single entity needs to talk to itself a little more successfully uh, for openers. Um, there was a report this week about uh, three hospitals in Cleveland getting together uh, to uh, share information, to work together, to improve the quality of the care in their region. and. Um, uh, it has to be not only within a city, but um, in, in Vermont, our, our second largest hospital is in New Hampshire, <laughs> the Dartmouth Medical Center, uh, in terms of the number of Vermonters who are served. So it has to be uh, a system that, uh, where information is shared across state lines, too. Um, so I think uh, standardization is key. Um, we, it raises a lot of other issues, Jason, too. Uh, uh, health um, professional licensure. Uh, if uh, you're in uh, Texas and you're providing some um, counsel to a primary care doc or a patient in Vermont. Are you practicing medicine in Vermont? Or do you have a license? Uh, so uh, as data become more widely available and shared, we have to address some, uh, some issues like that. Um, we talked about uh, workforce earlier this morning, and I think that's going to be key. Uh, the, the world is changing. Uh, some jobs are going away, but uh, we're going to need all kinds of new um, data scientists. Uh, I'm not even sure we know the name of the job now, but uh, but uh, folks who can uh, can use and interpret and uh, and facilitate the uh, implementation of, of um, uh, programs based on these data, uh, and we need true interoperability. Um, I, I guess that was 
or continues to be one of my disappointments in the uh, in the um, uh, federal efforts to uh, to encourage the creation of, of health care exchanges. Uh, uh, a lot of good work being done. Uh, we're making progress through the meaningful use standards, but we still don't have interoperability. And I guess if I were um, rolling back the clock to when Congress uh, um, uh, authorized that initially, I, I might have suggested some more um, encouragement for, uh, for that end. Thank you, Jim. So, Congressman Turner, I want to ask you to reflect on the same question with a little bit of a twist, which is, what reflections do you have about the institutions that are going to be necessary to help public decision makers who are not experts in these issues interpret the data? In my experience, um, other than the CBO, which to some extent does use big data to make budget projections, the OTA and other organizations, even universities, don't seem to quite have the same level of trust from Congress that they once did. Do you have any thoughts about how we as a you know, society can provide those kinds of interpretive institutions to bring the trust back? Well, obviously the, you know, the public does have a, a level of distrust in data collection by government. And, you know, I think that stems from our general sense of distrust of government. And it may be a little heightened today uh, because of recent uh, events. But when you look for the expertise, you know, it is difficult to find. And of course, this is true on a whole host of areas for members of Congress. So you don't have, uh, you know, experts in, in the Congress on too many subjects. Um, you know, occasionally you, you do have people who've come out of the business world or come out of government with some background that they then can apply when they're serving in Congress. But, you know, to try to find the, the expertise you need to make proper decisions is always going to be difficult. Um, you know, increasingly government is outsourcing a lot of the uh, work that is occurring in information collection and sharing. Um, you don't find the expertise within the ranks of government that you need, so that's, that's occurred in a natural course. And, and it also is done, I think, to help be sure that things can be done on a rapid pace. Uh, oftentimes the private sector can do that a little better than, than government can. But there's not, a, there's not one place that I could say that the Congress can look to for the expertise that it needs in the uh, new age of, of new data and big data. Um, I do think that there's a, a growing uh, interest and a growing concern uh, about what we do with all the data that we're collecting, how long do we keep it. Those can be in part political decisions that the Congress can make. Um, but I think we are handicapped with regard to expertise and we'll be handicapped with regard to, to moving forward into the work that needs to be done by government and the private sector in this new age uh, by lack of people that are trained to do it. So as moderator, my only real job is to bring this ship home on time. And so I think I'd like to now turn to the audience for just a couple of questions. Um, and please introduce yourself before you ask the question. Wait for the mic, Quinn. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Quinn Nee. I live here in Washington, D.C. And my question is uh, directed to Governor uh, Douglas. And it, and it kind of touches on uh, what the congressman had just said about uh, the handicap expertise. But Governor uh, Douglas, you mentioned, uh, um, well, first of all, congratulations as one of the healthiest states, first of all, because I lived in Hawaii for quite a while, and I, I thought we were the healthiest well, state. Well, you've done very well. <laughs> but um, you had mentioned the role of information technology, and um, I was at a conference at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce just a couple weeks ago on, on uh, disabled and employment. Um, little has been mentioned about uh, disability and it's still rapidly growing these days as we speak. Given the 54 million Americans that ha uh, are disabled in some form, shape uh, or another and continue to increase, how do you think integrative, how do you integrate uh, the assistive technologies for disabled, more specifically the uh, the re, uh, Section 508 of American Disabilities Act that was passed in 73, how do you see uh, data collection as, as uh, given these kind of uh, methods to help the disabled community using uh, 
the assistive technologies. Thank you. I think there are a couple of ways. Uh, as I mentioned initially, uh, uh, we're now using uh, data from non-clinical sources to uh, to integrate into our uh, clinical database. So uh, we have information about various social services that are provided to the people of Vermont, um, whether it's uh, um, um, TANF or, or other uh, um, subsidies or, or services of various kinds. And through that process, uh, we have a, a broader look at um, the needs of an individual and can make the kinds of referrals to uh, to um, uh, programs for those with disability that uh, uh, disabilities that may be uh, may be uh, necessary, and um, um, I, I think if we um, uh, focus on on not on getting out of the silos, uh, which is common in a lot of these uh, data collection uh, enterprises, we can uh, we can look at uh, the the entirety of someone's needs. And secondly, uh, on a voluntary basis, the Vermont Medical Society has adopted a protocol, I'm not sure how common it is uh, in other places, uh, that uh, invites its members to, um, to ask uh, patients at the time of their annual physicals questions that are far beyond the traditional health kinds of information. Um, uh, they, they're, they're probing to the extent that the patient is willing uh, to learn about what's going on at home. Um, you know, uh, is there a smoker in your house? Uh, um, I see you have a little uh, disability. Are, are there uh, accommodations made so that you can facilitate uh, um, uh, the, the daily tasks that are important to you? Um, so, so I think that on, on a voluntary and uh, governmental basis, there, there's a lot more awareness of, of integrating these uh, um, different types of data and the services that result from them. We had a final question in back. Yes, sir. My Johns Hopkins Healthcare um, um, elect electronic records work seamlessly. Uh, um, medical records, perfect in all the way. Uh, uh, University of Maryland electronic trackers, no, no problem. Sinai. Uh, uh, I found it at Johns. Uh, um, Harvard Bel Air Center, uh, four million dollar operation, Electro electronic rec records work fine, seamlessly. But today, uh, Obamacare, no Norton records, no um, McAfee records, Caspery, no records at all. Hackers, uh, Vermont hackers. Today, it's CNBC, uh, electronic electronic records uh, hacked in Vermont. Obamacare is in serious, serious trouble. Thank you. Well, I think as we both discussed, um, we have to look at the benefits and the risks and uh, try to address the latter so that there's a greater level of trust among the American people. And uh, I agree with you, the, the potential uh, and the reality for using electronic records is tremendous. Uh, way back eight or ten years ago, I remember visiting with some uh, physicians in Burlington, uh, our largest city, and they were showing me for the first time how they're using laptops with their patients' records right there. It was John Doe, so uh, HIPAA, HIPAA, uh, um, and, and how uh, the information at their fingertips was, was uh, allowing them to uh, provide a much better quality of care. And one of my favorite examples is a couple of hospitals in our state that have a, a medication history pilot project in their emergency departments, and there was a woman who came into the hospital in Rutland, our, our second largest city, uh, with severe abdominal pain. And um, uh, without uh, the medication history at the ED doctor's fingertips, who knows what might have happened? Uh, all kinds of tests that would have cost time and money, maybe even exploratory surgery. But in fact, the, the doctor looked at the, at the uh, record and said, well, Mrs. So-and-so, I see that you have prescribed such and such a uh, medication. Uh, it doesn't look like you uh, renewed your, you know, refilled your uh, prescription uh, recently. Uh, why don't you take one of these? And she was fine. 
So you're right, uh, the potential is tremendous. What we have to make sure is that we find some uh, uh, ways to address the security concerns, which are legitimate, uh, in order to facilitate the use of this new technology. All right, so um, again, I want to really thank uh, Intel for its partnership over the last year and Aspen for this uh, terrific collaboration. Um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, no matter what any of us think, this technological change is going to affect all our lives. At the Bipartisan Policy Center, our goal is to help develop policies to make sure that the benefits wildly outpace those risks. And of course, we'd like your help. Uh, we have put out a report today, which I think was mentioned, which is going to provide some basic framing. But we really welcome the opportunity, and Janet Marchabroda, who I think many of you know, is leading this effort and seems to work 24 hours a day. So she's always available. Um, <laughs> And so really, I just want to thank everybody. I want to particularly thank our panelists, both on this panel and the prior panels, and hope that we have an opportunity to have conversations like this in the future. Thanks a lot.